One of the reasons that we have this event is to celebrate our comic book collection, which is one of the um, largest in the world that's publicly available. And in particular, we're focusing on one particular part of the collection to celebrate, the SPX collection. And just to give you a little bit of background, in August 2011, the Library and the Small Press Expo joined together to facilitate and develop the library's SPX collection of sequential art, mini comics, graphic novels, and so much more. Many, much more than we ever thought when we were back in 2011. The Small Press Expo itself is an annual festival in Bethesda, Maryland, and it gives artists, writers, and publishers of comic art in all various forms the opportunity to meet and exhibit their creations. Under our partnership with SPX, the library acquires independent comics and cartoon art from creators and publishers appearing at the expo, as well as the submissions for the SPX Ignatz Award announced during the festival. Through today's talk, we're recognizing the rewards of the agreement. So far, we think we have over 10,000 items in the SPX collection between prints and photographs and um, the Serial and Government Publications Division. So it's no small collection, and we want to celebrate this comic art form. We have next door, if you haven't seen it already, after the talk, you can go next door and uh, take a look at selections that are from the SPX collection and also from DERF's creative input, output, excuse me. Um, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so now I'd like to introduce our partner in this program, Warren Bernard. He's the executive director of the Small Press Expo. And he'd like to say a few words, and he's also going to introduce DERF. Warren? Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Um, it's, it was very interesting first starting off with the Small Press Expo collection. We did not know how it was going to grow and where it was going to go, and now we've got quite a substantial repository of stuff from the SPX community. Now, Durf, um, his, he's actually had a footprint here in Washington, D.C. for many years. His, his uh, strip, The City, ran in the city paper. Washington City Paper for many years. And then he moved into doing long form graphic novels. His novel, graphic novel, My Friend Dahmer, not only was an Eisner Award winner, but it was also made into a movie, which is pretty amazing. I remember talking with Durf when the Kent State book was being formulated, and I had actually done a paper about Kent State when I was in college. And it was, to me, it still to me is one of the great graphic novels that have ever been done nonfiction. Anyway, it's my, my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Durf. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, it's really meaningful for me to be here, especially as of last year, I am officially a band author. Um, my friend Dahmer, which uh, Warren mentioned, has been banned in a several dozen school districts by you-know-who. And it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's incredibly moving to get this opportunity. So I'm very grateful to the Library of Congress and uh, to SPX. And read banned books. It's important. <laughs> so I'm here today to talk about Kent State, which has not been banned yet. Um, and it is, uh, as most of you know, the story of May 1970 when the National Guard at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, opened fire on a group of protesters. And we all know the song, you've seen the images. You think you know the story? You probably really don't. And it's much more complex than uh, it's been recounted in, in popular culture. So, my book takes place in four days in May, and I'd like to talk a little bit about 
the story at first, it was May 1970. Think back to 2020 and remember how bad that was. Multiply that by about 50 and you get to 1970. It was called at the time the year that trembled. And the entire country seemed like it was teetering on the, on the edge of mass insurrection, particularly college campuses. Of course, it was all revolving around the Vietnam War. Nixon had escalated the war, and every major campus in the United States exploded in protest in May 1970. At Kent State, the same thing happened. And it started uh, Friday night in the Bar District in Kent, Ohio, when uh, some anti-war sentiment got a little out of hand, and there was a march down the mainstream, some windows got smashed. The next night, a group of student protesters on campus attacked the ROTC building, that is, of course, the Reserve Office Training Corps, which is the Pentagon's uh, foothold in college campuses, and they torched it. And this happened in a number of colleges in 1970, actually. But this one was particularly spectacular because unknown to the students, the basement was full of ammo. So as soon as, as, soon as the flames hit the ammo, poof, it went up in a fireball. At that moment, the National Guard poured onto campus from four different directions. 1,200 guardsmen. And they attacked not only the five, six hundred protesters who had attacked the Razi building, they swept over campus and brutally beat, chased, bayoneted, gassed every student they encountered. It was a campus of 23,000 students. It was open because the governor had refused to close the university, as that would be giving in to the uh, student radicals at the time. He was a strong man, governor. <clears throat> The next day, uh, the students were understandably upset about this, and being 1970, they decided to have a sit-in on the main street of, uh, of Kent, right in front of the, the university, and the guard attacked. It was known as the night of the helicopters, and the guard swept into the protest, chased the students back onto campus. A dozen students were bayoneted. Uh, many were beaten, gassed, arrested. It was a very, very brutal reprisal. Which brings us to Monday, May 4. There was another protest on campus because they're not giving up. This time it's on the Commons, where 500 students uh, chanted guard off campus. The guard again attacked, chased them across uh, College Green, <coughs> gassing not only the students who were protesting, but again, all of the students on campus. It was the noon class break, and if you've ever been on a major college campus at noon, you know what that's like. Every building emptied, the guard ran smack into them. I will charitably describe it as a total clusterfuck. And the people running this operation were just, they were idiots, and unfortunately, tragic idiots. Then, uh, at one point, a contingent of guardsmen, for, for reasons known only to them, on command, turned in unison and opened fire down the hill into a parking lot full of about 800 students. <clears throat> Thirteen students were shot, four were killed, nine were wounded seriously. Five of the nine were uh, critically injured, two of them disabled for life. <clears throat> Whoops, we'll get back to that. Um, so that's the story. But it's a, of course you've got a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving pieces. It's a period piece, very comp complicated to pull together. And it's a story that's been told many times, not in a while, and certainly not in graphic narrative. That was what I felt I could bring to this story, a visual narrative of what happened, which had not really been done before. We have lots of photos, but photo ref you know, a photo record is different than graphic narrative. That's the power of my art form, that I can take these visuals and actually lead the reader through this, um, this event. But 
you know, I needed something more. And it's like, what can I bring to this story besides that? And very early on, I decided to focus on the four, the four who were killed. They are from uh, the top uh, left, Sandy Scheuer, Bill Schroeder, Jeff Miller, Allison Krauss. Four very typical students, four very remarkable kids. The oldest was 20, the youngest was 19, and she had just turned 19. <clears throat> My idea was to show this entire series of events through their eyes. So I'm placing the reader right there with them at their elbow as we walk through these four days. You see what they see. You experience what they experience. And my belief was is that this would make this story very personal. And when they're cut down, you know, this book, it, it packs a wallop, which was, I freely admit, was by design. I wanted, this, I wanted this to be history that was felt, the way that the students of 1970 still feel this history. Of all the people that I interviewed who were there, I can't tell you how many of those interviews ended with, with the people weeping. I mean, it's still very, very real to them. And that's what I was really trying to tap into because that, I think, is what makes great history. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, where's my water? So as the story unfolds with these kids through their eyes, you see, you know, we learn about them as, as we go along and they become fleshed out. I, I, I really spent a lot of time researching these kids, talking to people who knew them. Um, uh, I'll get into the research in just a few minutes. <clears throat> um, they're all very distinct kids with different personalities. <clears throat> I also found uh, the account of a guardsman in the May 4 archive. And it's a great account. And it, 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 He's at present at every single event that happens. He takes part in some of the, the brutalities. He was one of the shooters. Um, he didn't shoot anybody. He fired one gun into the air. He lied about it later. He lied to uh, investigators about shooting, but he did shoot. And normally that would be a problem, you know, um, from a journalism standpoint. I mean, if somebody lies about something, the problem is they all lied. So, I mean, I was really, I really didn't have that option. And his, his account is so perfect that I just had to use it. I wanted that perspective, not, you know, the, 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 the cable news, you know, one side, other side perspective. I just wanted the perspective of that experience, what these guardsmen were going through, because they were, they were subject to as much abuse as the students. Their officers were just ordering them here and, and, and there and with no plan, and they were low on sleep. They, were, they had been on duty for a week at that point. Uh, facing some pretty serious conditions. Again, it was just a total debacle. So I wanted that experience. <clears throat> now the story for me starts in my hometown, which is about uh, 20 miles uh, outside of Kent. Kent is about 35 miles south of Cleveland, for you to put it into perspective. It's a little tiny college town, very pretty, um, in the, surrounded by rural Ohio farm fields. <clears throat> And I grew up in a small town nearby, but just before the events of Kent State, the National Guard invaded my hometown. They were sent in to crush a Teamster strike. You can see the strike in the back of this uh, double page spread there. That had gotten a little out of hand. Um, the, the trucking companies tried to use strike breakers to break the strike. The Teamsters uh, took umbrage with this, as you can imagine. <laughs> And there were some, you know, shots fired, things thrown off bridges, that kind of thing. So the governor sent in the guard to, to crush the strike. Now, oh, here's an actual photo of it. This is my hometown with, uh, with the guard in front of the Sunoco station. <clears throat> now, I was just a kid. I was only 10 years old. But I remember this event very vividly. You know, as if at that moment, the entire, this entire contentious era just kind of rushed in and popped that bubble that I had of this little blissful kid life. And it's like, here are these, team, here are these soldiers in my hometown. And, you know, these Teamsters were boogeymen to uh, the governor 
but these were my neighbors. I mean, the town was full of Teamster kids. I knew these men. So it, it really rattled me when the school buses would go down this stretch of road where the trucking companies were and the guard, the bus driver would make the kids lie on the floor of the bus until we got through it, as if that would have done anything. But, you know, that leaves a mark. So that is my, I've always carried this story with me ever since because of this. And then two days later, the events at Kent State blew up. And suddenly it's this historic event. And so it's, it's just a story I've always had with me, and I thought it would be a great story. <clears throat> it was just a question of getting to it. Oh, here's a, a political cartoon I drew at age 10 about the guard in my hometown. It's not bad for a 10-year-old. Precocious little bastard. Um, I leveled off after that, though, for a while. <laughs> Now, of course, the, the Vietnam War, just a little background, you've got to remember the Vietnam War was a war that was fought by conscripts, not volunteers, like every war since. In fact, it was because of Vietnam that every war since has been fought by volunteers. The draft added rocket fuel to the anti-war movement. It was the bane of that generation. If you talk to somebody who was alive back then and say, what was your draft number, they will rattle it off right away. It was a national, it was a, really the obsession of that generation. How do I stay out of Vietnam? <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I said, in May 1970, the entire nation exploded. It's just that we'd reached a tipping point. People had had enough of the Vietnam War, they wanted out. And Nixon was escalating the war. He had invaded neighboring Cambodia, and that just set off all kinds of. Uh... This is Kent. Even in Kent, there was a uh, protest. Now, the interesting thing about this photo is so many photos. Right above the A there on the top line, that's Allison, one of the four who was killed. That's the 19-year-old. She was a committed peace activist. She wasn't a violent radical. She was just a peace activist. And uh, she paid for her convictions with her life at age 19. <clears throat> so research to start this book first of all reading of course just like uh, doing any term paper you start with reading and I read and read and read some more there's a lot to understand this is not this you know this is not my generation um, I was born you know I came of age a decade later and the world had changed I didn't even have a draft number I didn't even have to register for the draft there was that window there where uh, I, like a half generation of us didn't have to register so it was, you know, it was just, wasn't even on my mind. I remember it as a little kid, you know, the classic war spilling out of the TV, but it was not my experience. I didn't face that fear. I also didn't go to Kent. I went to a different college. So I'm a complete outsider here, so I had a lot to catch up with. I mean, I've always followed the story, so I had that background. I live nearby. I live in Cleveland. So it's, uh, it's not completely foreign, but it's still difficult. So the way I approached it, first of all, I just talked to people who were there. And I probably interviewed 50, 60 people who were there that weekend. Campus of 23,000 students, there's a lot of people who were there. And in fact, throughout my career, you know, my comics career, it's always surprised me how many times I encounter people who were there at Kent State. In the business, in media, I worked in the press for many years, there were a lot of press people who were there. Um, I, and so I would approach them and that would lead me to other people and so on and so forth. I wanted to get as close to these people as I could so I focused on their friends, their roommates, that kind of thing and really tried to get, I wanted to get right on top of them and find out what these four people were like. <clears throat> uh, the May 4 collection at Ohio State, or Kent State, sorry, whoops, that's my alma mater. Uh, Kent State is a massive archive. It's just full of everything. Now, for about 20 years after the, the massacre, uh, there was a huge cover-up. And there were a lot of lies, a lot of misdirection, a lot of stuff was buried. Much of that has come to the surface since then. I mean, we're talking 50 years in the rearview mirror. So this, this stuff is just, I mean, it's an interesting problem because there was just a mountain of material. 
And I mean, court transcripts, uh, FBI reports, which is like 30,000 pages, uh, just on and on and on and on. But you, you know, you do, your, you do your homework and you find gold in there. <clears throat> uh, the Yale, believe it or not, Yale University has its own archive because there were civil cases after the shooting. The family sued the, uh, uh, the guard and the governor. All of that material from those cases went to Yale because they didn't want it stored in Ohio, the families, I mean. So there was more material. And then this is the FBI report, which is all public now, redacted, of course, but it's all there. And then uh, the Daily Kent Stater was a wonderful archive. This is the university newspaper. It's a pretty good newspaper at the time. And it just has all of this, not only about the radical politics that were going on, which nobody else was covering, but also just a real insight into what was happening on campus, you know. The, these are the bands that are playing. These are the plays that are going on. This is the art exhibit that's happening. Because I'm, I'm trying to create this, this setting, which I'm completely unfamiliar with, such a tiny window, four days in May, but I wanted to get it right. And so these are the things that, again, you try to get as close to it as you can. Come on, there we go. Uh, and then we had to figure out the radical politics of the time, which is quite challenging. There was a lot of things happening in the, in, uh, the student left. It was a very, very contentious year. This is SDS, which is Students for a Democratic Society, which was the big student group that was behind a lot of the protests that were happening from 1968 to 1970. They had been, <clears throat> excuse me, taken over by their radical left wing called the Weathermen, who some of you may have heard of. The whole thing had melted down. It was a complete uh, uh, disaster by this time, but you still had, you know, you had to figure this stuff out. And a lot of these people are not talking. And Kent State was a Weatherman hotbed too. Very small contingent there. It was really fun stuff, you know. I have to admit, I really get into this. And then in the Kent State archive, I find, you know, once as I was talking about finding gold, here's some gold. These are letters that Bill, one of the four students who was killed, wrote to his mom every week. Now, Bill was a young ROTC cadet, believe it or not, though he was having doubts. But there's these wonderful letters, really playful and full of humor and jokes, and it's just such a great insight into someone's personality. And I just stumbled across these. She, his, his mom, this is one of those moving things, his mom saved all his letters in an old crock pot box, which was wrapped in duct tape. And on the side, in magic marker, she wrote, Save Forever. And she donated that to the university uh, archive at one point. Whoops. And then the you know, news reports and, and all that stuff. I mean, it's just, it just went on and on and on and on. There's like, uh, Karen, how many footnotes are there in the back? How many pages? 30 pages? I think 30 pages of footnotes in the back. I unfortunately become known in the comics world for my footnotes, <laughs> which is kind of a curse, but... Um, and then the photo archive. Again, this is a visual medium, so I spend as much time doing... Well, I, we'll get to comics in a minute, trust me. Um, I spend as much time getting photo reference as I did doing any other kind of reference, because it's a visual medium. And again, this is a very small window. The campus has completely changed. The town has completely changed. <clears throat> so I relied on things like campus maps, which are really great, you know, because it's a picture of the buildings that were there. Not only that, with this, uh, they had a flat one too that was really terrific, which I blew up. And I used that as reference as I was composing scenes. I would actually move my characters around the map and figure out what was behind them and what was in front of them, and then I'd go and track down those buildings in the photo archive so I could recreate the buildings. And I was really determined to get it right, and I only screwed up one roof line, and I'm not going to even admit which roof line that was. <coughs> and I'm really pissed that I, got, I screwed up that roof line. To make it even more complicated, half of the university was under construction because the buildings were going up like crazy. Kent State was a 
a campus of uh, 5,000 in 1960, 23,000 by 1970. It had 35 buildings in 1960, over 100 in 1970. So you can imagine the kind of, it was like, you know, New York City. I mean, it was just buildings popping up everywhere. And some of them were only half completed. And so I had to figure out which ones were, not, were half completed. I know it's kind of crazy. Here's how deep down the rabbit hole I went. We're back to comics. This is the bar district. It was called Water Street, which are the first night's riot happened, right? I had to recreate this, this bar district in 1970, and I was bound and determined to get it right, and it took me months. Um, because, well, this is what it looks like today. You know, half of it's gone. They had a bunch of fires, half of it's closed. There's a big difference between that and that. I couldn't find photo reference for this because, you know, this is the age of photography in 1970. It's expensive, it's time consuming. You had to have a camera, you had to have film, you had to pay for film, processing, prints. You get, have, you get them back and half the roll's out of focus and oh crap, I gotta do it again. So nobody was taking photos of this street because who cares? It's you know, just a bunch of you know scummy little bars in Kent, Ohio. <clears throat> so what I did was, first of all, I went to the street guides, pulled them out of the library. These are great. This is Journalism 101. I learned it in journalism school, and it shows every building that was, every business that was there in 1970, where they were. Then I made a, I made a map. And I went down to Kent and I would line up the addresses, the existing addresses, to make sure everything was lined up. And then I just started filling in the gaps. And this took a long time. And I had a couple, uh, a couple archivists down there who were helping me with this. And it sort of be, kind of became a challenge, you know. What the hell was in this building? <clears throat> and then um, I was looking through documentaries just to cover my bases. And I found one from late 1970, and the narrator is standing on Water Street. And he walks down the middle of Water Street talking about the riot. And I'm just, I let out a scream in my studio as I'm watching, and I'm taking screenshots like crazy. Because there it all is. You've got these crazy facades, the cheesy signs, everything, it's all there. I just lucked out, but you know, I just kept going until I found, it what I found what I needed, and that's what you have to do. I mean, something like this is just pure gold. That's classic Americana. <laughs> and there it is in, the, in, that, in that strip. I put it in. And so when this scene unfolds, what you see in the background behind these kids is the correct store with the correct signage in the right place. And what I've heard from a lot of the students of 1970 it was like, man, you really nailed <laughs> Water Street. How did you do that? I was like, well, it was easy. <laughs> um, but it was important for me to get it right because, you know, the more details you get right, the more legitimate your history is. And the people who read it, certainly the local people understand that. And uh, the response down there has been really great. But even I don't think if, you, if, you, if you're not local, you see the detail that's there, you see the footnotes, and you think, wow, this guy really did his homework. So it adds like a little legitimacy to the, what I'm doing here. <clears throat> and it was all about me. Um, here's, another, here's another one. This one I really struck gold. This is a little painting that was donated to the May 4 Center, which is the Kent State Archive, by Sandy's roommate. No one knew this existed. And her roommate never talks. She, she has never talked and, and didn't answer my queries either. But she included a note with this painting. It's a sweet little painting. This was painted by Sandy and Jeff Miller, one of the other students who were shot. And there's a little note saying, you know, they, were, they said they were, had it spread out on the floor they were painting and giggling and kind of, you know, nudging each other. And she said, it seemed to me like they were getting really fond of each other. I wonder if it led, it, you know, if something else was going on there. I'm like, hmm. So I immediately contacted Jeff's roommates, who I had, I had uh, a lot of uh, 
friends of Jeff who agreed to talk to me. And I said, were Sandy and Jeff starting a relationship? And every single one said, oh, yeah. Yeah. They were just, they were just starting, just a couple of kids, 20-year-old kids, enjoyed each other's company, starting to get physical and romantic. And that just adds a whole nother level of poignancy to this because these two kids died a hundred feet apart in that parking lot not knowing the other one was there I mean jeez and that's all just because I kept asking questions again journalism 101 you think something and you ask it and I work the painting into this uh, this scene the book is structured I mean each day the four days there's a lot of quiet scenes at the beginning and then the tensions build and then there's a big event. And then you know, the next day is the same thing until finally we get to the massacre. <clears throat> it's a real unusual story structure. There's a lot of quiet scenes, but I really love these quiet scenes because this is where we get to learn these kids, who these kids are, and we get to know them and what, how they move through, the, through their lives, how they interact with each other and how they fit in this world. Now think about what we're looking at here. This is a scene where Sandy's mom shows up with a trunk load full of clothes that Sandy wanted, summer clothes. A nice little typical college event. But think about it a little more because two days later her daughter would be dead. So this is the last time. She holds her in her arms, she smells her hair, she hears her voice. The next time Mrs. Scheuer sees her daughter, she's laying dead on a slab in the morgue. That's a pretty powerful scene. So, you know. <clears throat> and then in the photo archive, you, 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 again, you find these things that, if you just look carefully, you can really find some very moving things. For example, this is moments, and I mean moments, before the guard opens fire. The guard is coming up the hill on the other side at the top back of the photo. You see that umbrella-like structure there at the top? That's called the pagoda. It's a stupid little architectural thing that wasn't spo was supposed to be torn down years ago, but it's still there because it's so historically significant now. When the guard came up the hill from the other side, about 15 of them turned on command and opened fire down the hill into that parking lot. Now look at those kids. Do those look like violent protesters to you? They've all got books in their hands. They're walking from class back to their dorms. The classrooms are on the, uh, the right. The dorms are all on the left. The photographer's in the middle of the parking lot. There are, there's more parking lot behind with just as many kids there's a big road called Midway Drive, which cuts through the campus that was packed with kids. That's what the guard opened fire into. Now, look at the trunk of the car there and go straight up. You see that girl holding the coat? That's Sandy. This is seconds before she was murdered. It's the last photo of her alive. So, you know, when you find these photos, you just, it's... It's pretty emotional. And you know, I was trying to tap into that emotion to tell this story. <clears throat> A little bit about violence. This book ends with the massacre, and I take 15 pages to tell it. And I do not spare the violence. And that was by design. I decided that early on, and here's why. <clears throat> we have lots of photos of all of the events of that day, you know, the guard chasing students around, the gassing, the, all of that stuff. Because the, the campus had a good journalism program and it had a good photography program. It was crawling with student photographers. There must have been a hundred of them out there. One of them was shot, in fact, critically. So there are t just tens of thousands of photos of the events of that several hours. <clears throat> then there's a very iconic photo of the guard turning and opening fire, and then nothing for, you know, five minutes. And then all of those 
photos of the carnage that we all know. <clears throat> what I wanted to do was fill in that gap. And the reason there are no photos of that gap is because the students all very wisely hit the dirt because they were all in the line of fire. <clears throat> but the power of my art form is that I can create these images. I can show the previously un unseen. And I did this from personal accounts, news reports, eyewitness accounts, medical reports, morgue reports. I know exactly what happened to these kids and how they were hit. And, and, and I talked to some of the wounded, in fact, too. So I fill in this gap. And the reason I did that was because I thought it was important. Because in 1970, just as in 2020, there was a large contingent, much more in, 20, in 1970, in fact, of Americans who thought that the students had what was com got what was coming to them. And, and even more, they thought, let's shoot a bunch of them and put an end to this. It was that kind of thinking. It's the same thing we had in 2020, you know, Black Lives Splatter during the Black Lives Protest, uh, all of that nonsense. Even worse in 1970. And my thinking was, okay, you think that? Here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like when copper jacketed bullets over an inch long go tearing through a parking lot full of 800 students, fired from guns so powerful they can put one of those bullets through a foot thick tree trunk and kill the person on the other side. This is what it looks like. And it's not pretty. <clears throat> when I uh, was finishing this book, um, Sandy's sister contacted me. She heard I was working on it because word spread. <laughs> and uh, she had some questions about some details that I was able to answer for. And, and I told her, I said, you know, I don't think you want to read this book. And I explained to her what I just explained to you. And she said, oh, you have to show that violence. People need to know what was done to Sandy. And that was really confirmation that I, I made the right decision. But it is, it is an ending that packs a wallop. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about process. How do I make comics? Uh, making comics is easy. Making good comics, now that's a little harder. But making comics itself is pretty easy. Um, I start with uh, thumbnails. These are called roughs, They're, uh, or thumbnails. They're just on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. Well, that's kind of small in there, isn't it? Sorry. Um, they're very, very rough. And I take my, I usually do a script with nonfiction comics. I like to do a script, so I just type it out. Very loose script, almost like a screenplay. And then I start doing my visuals and figuring out how I'm going to tell this story visually. <clears throat> From there, I go to a tight pencil. Yeah, that's a little better. Um, and this is the most in time intensive part of the process because this is where I pour in all that research. All the, the period clothes, the cars, the buildings, all of that stuff. This is where I got to, and I'm creating these images out of essentially nothing at this point. So it takes a while. <clears throat> After that, I throw on the ink. And then it all gets scanned into the computer. At some point, everything becomes digital. Some people do digital work from the very beginning. I like to come in late because, uh, you know, I just like the, I like the act of drawing. I like pencil scraping over paper. It's something I enjoy. So when it gets scanned into the computer, then it, um, I add the tones after that. Um, now, this is a two-page spread. Two pages, you know, the pages. When you open a book, it's you know, two pages, right? So we have to think in terms of how that fits together. How does that narrative fit together? How does that visual fit together? <clears throat> and I know this is going to be a very dramatic scene because it's the Razi building on fire. You got this fire, shadow, flame, really deep blacks. 
<clears throat> but I don't have to put it all in just yet. I mean, I know I'm already thinking about how I'm going to do it. This is the pencil, and that's, that's the finish. So you can see, you can follow it from, whoops, sorry, thumbnail, pencil, finish. You can see it doesn't change much. I mean, I really see it after this many years of making these damn things. I mean, I really, I really see it pretty clearly. <clears throat> now this is, of course, one of the, the most famous photo. This is Marianne Vecchio screaming over the body of Jeff Miller, who was killed instantly. He was shot through the mouth. At the moment he screamed, he yelled, guard off campus, they shot him through the mouth. Um, he was dead before he hit the pavement. This is the famous photo. And how was I going to depict this? I mean, I, you had to depict it, but my challenge was, how do I make it a little different? You know, just to recreate it, it's kind of lame. Um, I wanted to add something a little more to this scene than, and do it in a different way than anyone else had done. And I was messing around with the thumbnail, and it just wasn't working out. <laughs> and so this one is actually one I created in the pencil. Now this is three pages. So I started on the previous spread page, and then two pages on the right, that's the spread when you turn the page. And what you see is I'm focusing on the scream. The scream is the dominant element here. And that comes from talking to people who are in that parking lot, lots of people. And what they told me was, <clears throat> it was this horrible fusillade that seemed to go on forever. And then dead silence. Just this horrible dead silence. They all talked about the silence. And then from all around, screams. And so I thought, yeah, that's what I want to capture. I want to capture that horror. So I'm making the, the sound effect the dominant visual element. This is unique to comics. Only we can do this. So this is ours. So I was really happy with this, uh, the way that this came together. <clears throat> and that's how, you know, that's how comics are made, one by one. I mean, it just, uh, it was uh, 280 pages, I think. It took me four years to make this book. Two years just of research and interviews, then two years to draw while I continued to research right up to the end. I could have kept going, but I mean, I had a deadline. I was trying to, <laughs> the original plan was to uh, uh, publish it in conjunction with the 50th commemoration of the massacre, which happened to be May 2020. And something happened. Um, it's hard to remember now what it was. Uh, some kind of sniffle, I think, was going around. And it all turned, it all just went to crap. <laughs> and so the, the book was delayed, and then, you know, it just was one thing after another. Um, so that was all in vain. But, you know, what can you do? <laughs> um, <clears throat> And I was, I was continuing to research right up into the end. In fact, I landed an interview with one of uh, Allison's uh, roommates like two weeks before my deadline and changed some dialogue because of that. So I, I, I really could have kept going. And even after I turned the book in, I just, I was just, you know, eh. I just kept following, doing some more reading. I, I got really deep into some of the radical uh, student groups and it was just, I couldn't stop. Uh, I think I've cured myself now, but. Uh, and that's how the book came together. So, if we have any uh, questions, we've got plenty of time. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Hi, Dirk. Hi. Um, thank you for talking about the three-page shriek. That's such a powerful moment, um, and you're right. Only comics can do it. But your sound effects throughout this book are extraordinary. They really are like another character. So could you talk a little bit about how you 
how you worked with the sound effects and what decisions you made. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of a comics thing. I've always loved sound effects in comics. Um, actually, won an Eisner Award for lettering, which is uh, the Oscars of comics. That was my first Eisner, and uh, I was very proud of that. And I think it's really an, imp an important part of you know it's it's just every sense you know, one of our senses that you can somehow get on paper, I think, is really crucial to uh, telling the story. And different places have different sounds. And I think that is definitely the sound of, there was definitely the sound of Kent, Ohio. It was definitely the sound of that particular event. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time doing that. And that's one of the, you know, a book like this, I wouldn't call it fun. Uh, because it's, you know, it's very emotional, and there were those last pages, you know, the pages of the massacre, I put them off to the end and then did, just did them all at once, and that was tough. That was a tough week, um, especially since I'd gotten to know so many of these people. Uh, but you try to find fun in a project like this, even a tragedy where you can, and sound effects to me are fun. So it's purely selfish motivation here. And uh, you know, I think it pays off if you, you know, pour a little love into something that uh, you know, can get, that has a benefit. Yes. Thank you, you gave me a whole new appreciation for comics. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, what goes into it. <laughs> um, you mentioned the drama. Has your book ever been used, or do you think it might, to make a play? Or uh, sure there have been there have been talks with uh, a filmmaker, yeah. But um, you know, it's still kind of hard to pull off something like this. Uh, it certainly wasn't going to happen during the pandemic. Um, with you know, trying to recreate a campus of twenty three thousand, that was not going to happen. But um, I don't know. Um, my one of my books was made into a, a film, and uh, another one has been optioned, and that's still in play. So, honestly, I don't I don't know how any films get made. Having been up close with the process, I, I'm amazed that anything gets made at all. Um, so I don't even worry about it. I just focus on on making the best comics I can, and hopefully, good things will happen when I do that. So far, that's been the case. It'd make a great movie. <laughs> There was one bad TV movie that came out, I believe in 81 for some reason. It's not good. And that is really the only film we've ever had of this event, as hard as it is to believe. And lately there's been like, a, you know, there's been a plethora of them. There was the trial of the Chicago 7, there was the Fred Hampton thing, all of that is from the same era, and those were, those were pretty good. So it's there. Any filmmakers in here tonight? <laughs> um, no, I think it would be a very strong film. Any more? Yes. So what's your next project after this? <laughs> I'm not ready to announce it yet. Um, I'm about uh, two years into it and uh, probably another year from announcing it. But it's another period piece, different period. And uh, it's another, I would say, drama, historical drama. And then after that, I'm just going to do a comedy, you know. Just like, I, get a, I need a break. <laughs> but you know, I'll keep making comics. Work till you die. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for your book. It's, uh, oh, uh, you're welcome. I, I haven't read it. I'll have to go out, go out and get it. <laughs> um, I'm from that generation. I graduated in 1970 from uh -huh. uh, Boston University okay. from Cleveland. Yeah, uh, we certainly knew a lot about Kent State when it was happening, and my folks were so upset about what happened there. They wanted me to come home from, you know, from BU, and what I felt and said at the time was, I said, you know, they don't know how to handle these things in Kent State or any other. Well, I shouldn't say any other, but I just felt like I was safer in Boston or New York, where they were so used to dealing with just pe peaceful protests with students. <laughs> Etc. that right. I was safer there than I would be here. Now, and they also, so just a comment to share, it was very important to me, because again, I'm from that generation. Um, a question, you didn't say too much about the guardsmen, and we've heard 
you know, over the years that they were young themselves. They were ROT, right. whatever, students or gra recent yeah. graduates. Um, it, it, was that true, and how does that figure into uh, that? That was not true. That was a uh, spin from the guard. Pretty much the first 100 things that came out of the guard were all lies. Um, starting with, there was a sniper, that's why we fired, there was no sniper. The students were armed, the students were not armed. We were surrounded, they were not surrounded. There were a thousand students charging us up the hill, they were not. Um, there were baseball, uh, rocks as big as uh, oranges being thrown, none of this was true. Um, and one of those things is that, well, our guard, the guardsmen were just as young as the kids, they weren't. The average, the medium age of, uh, median age of a guardsman uh, who opened fire was 28 years old. There's a big difference between a 28-year-old and a 19-year-old. Most of the guardsmen were family men. Most of them had, were married. They had jobs. A lot of them were cops. Uh, that was the most common uh, profession. They were older. And, um, yeah, you can't chalk that up to youthful... Uh, now, the guardsmen themselves, I mean, it was mostly the officers who were at fault for this, and, of course, the politicians. <clears throat> this was a very, they were, they were trying to make a political statement. The governor was actually running for a primary, and he was pandering to his base by coming down hard on student protesters, and it blew up in his face. Well, unfortunately, it didn't blow up in his face. It blew up in their face. Um, so that I blame them more than anything. And it was just the general uh, atmosphere of fear and anxiety, and everybody thought there was this, you know, that there was going to be this, this, this mass uprising of all these student radicals who were going to blow up everything, and on and on and on and on. None of this, of course, came to fruition. So it was, it was just a moment in time, though, where there was a lot of, a lot of fear and distrust. And but the lies are really hard to, uh, what I have to say about this is none of the, the guardsmen don't talk. I mean, I found two guardsmen who were willing to talk to me out of 1,200. Now I didn't talk to all 1,200, obviously. A lot of them have gone. All the officers are dead. Um, <clears throat> but they've never talked. It's a wall of silence. I think that's... Fairly, fairly telling in of, in of itself. The students, they're, they're willing to talk. And not all of them, but uh, it, it was, that was kind of a, a mixed bag. But, <clears throat> I mean, what are they hiding? Well, they've got a lot of secrets. And uh, it'd be nice if someone on their deathbed gave us some clarity, but I'm, I, we're running out of time. Yeah. You've uh, spoken a, a couple of times about um, the emotional impact, um, both of the historical event and in the choices that you made in telling this incredible story. Um, can you speak to how you handled that emotional aspect yourself in order to create this for the rest of us? Yeah, I mean, I had my... I had the same uh, challenge with my best known work, which is My Friend Dahmer, which is the true story of my teenage friendship with Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, at a certain, what I did with that book and what I did also with Kent State is that at a certain point you have to detach emotionally from the story and just focus on the nuts and bolts of making comics. Of, composing these pages and drawing the details and you just kind of push the other stuff out of your mind and that is fun for me so that's how I get through it but you know there are there are bumps I mean obviously I said when I did that last scene you know of the slaughter yeah that was tough and I knew it was going to be tough so but you know I think it should be tough and because it's a tough scene and, you know, my wife read it for the first time. She was just weeping. So um, I, I can't say that's a triumph, but, I mean, that's the kind of emotion I was trying to, to, to get out of the story. And I've heard it a lot that it's like, wow, that ending. So, and I ended right there. I mean, that's really the end of the book. Now, this story goes on for another 10 years. 
because there's the cover-up, the court trials, all that. It's a different story. And it didn't end well for anyone um, in the student community or the victims' families. And there's some really horrible stuff, you know, like uh, all the parents were, were harassed by, uh, I'll call them trolls, it was pre-trolls, but for example, Jeff's mom received uh, a package with feces inside to a, dead, to a mother mourning her dead son. Um, yeah, I mean, you could just go on and on, but I, I just kind of cut. I wanted it. To, I wanted to leave the walk away to be that that scene. It's like I wanted someone to get to the end of this book and just go, "Holy shit!" And um, that's what I was. That was by design. I uh, happen to agree with what you said about the guardsmen because it's kind of a us versus them mentality. I did yeah. about 20 in the Navy, and there's kind of that attitude, you know, civilians in military. You probably will be a death bed confession of some relative coming out and saying, this is what he told me, <clears throat> honestly. Right. Well, a lot of those guys, um, you know, I mean, I know some of them. I mean, most of those guys were just trying to stay out of Vietnam because the Guard at the, in 1970, they weren't sent overseas. They were purely a domestic force. So those were very coveted positions. You remember uh, George W. Bush got a cushy spot in the uh, Texas National Guard to stay out of Vietnam. Um, so you either stayed in college, like uh, Bill Clinton did, or you, you got a guard spot like George Bush did, or so many others. There were a lot of ways to keep out of Vietnam. <clears throat> so those guys were not, you know, most of those guys were not malevolent. They were just, but they were fed up. I mean, they'd been at it for days and days and days, and the students weren't stopping. They were badly outnumbered. And the frustration was growing. They were tired. Of course, you know, needing a nap is not an excuse for murder. Um, now, the guys who fired into the crowd, it was a small contingent of one unit called G Troop. This doesn't apply to those guys. They had bad intentions. Now, we don't exactly know what, because none of them have ever talked. But you don't turn as one, fire down a hill into a parking lot full of students without knowing that you're going to kill somebody. I mean, these guys, and these were older guys, too. They were even older than the, the rest of the guardsmen. They were all in their uh, early 30s. So, yeah, it was, it, it's still hard to justify. It's just, it's, it's mind boggling, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Okay, on that note, having been in the National Guard myself, did they all have live ammo? Yes. Yes. Okay, that changes. Didn't you see, it? here's the thing, and as a guardsman, you know, Today, there is a wide array of crowd control, non-lethal crowd control armaments. You have rubber bullets, you have sound cannons, heat guns, you have a variety of gases, you have body armor, you have clubs, shields, all of this stuff. None of that existed in 1970. The Ohio National Guard was using World War II surplus. They were carrying M1s which is the, you know, the, the standard issue weapon of World War II. Very deadly weapon. Patton called it the perfect war weapon. It's Patton. But um, it had a range of two miles. And in fact, two miles away at Kent, uh, one of the bullets went through a wall of an apartment, and they found it on the floor inside. Um, they just didn't have any of that. They had, they had rifle butts, they had gas, and they had bayonets. And finally they had bullets. But yeah, they were all armed. And the tragedy is that the students did not believe they were armed. And there's a really interesting part of the, uh, uh, of the book. There was a, uh, the first, a very important uh, black student group on campus called Black United Students. And they were one of the first protest groups. Now, they were mostly after uh, 
issues important to them, more black faculty, more recruitment of uh, black students, uh, black studies program, that kind of stuff, black student center. <clears throat> but these were all kids from Cleveland, Akron, and Youngstown, all of which had had unrest in black neighborhoods in 66, 67, and 68, where the governor sent in the National Guard. And there were, there were beatings, there was gas, there were shootings. I mean, it was really violent. Cleveland was in flames. <clears throat> as was Detroit, as was Newark, on and on and on. <clears throat> so these kids at Kent, uh, these African-American kids, the moment the guard came on campus, the leaders of Black United Students said, that's it, we're out. Stay in your dorms, don't go to the protests. These guys mean business because they knew what it meant when the guard came in. The white kids had no friggin' clue. They thought those kids, they thought those guns were, had blanks. Even as the bullets were being fired, they said, don't worry, they're blanks. Until, I mean, you can, I had one guy said, you know, I thought they were blanks, and then I saw, like, the bullets bouncing off the pavement in the parking lot. And then one went through a car window, and I realized, oh my God. And then they all bit the dust, but then it was too late. So I find that just, I think that's fascinating, the, the different experience of, it's a great scene in the book. I was really proud of composing that. Um, but yeah, that's, so those two things really factored into the tragedy of what was happening here. Naivete from the students and deadly combat weaponry on a college campus. It's mind boggling. Yeah. So there have been other accounts written, I guess. I think maybe one by James Michener. Are you? Familiar? Oh, yeah. Genesis, yeah. yeah. So could you make a comment maybe just about were there any legitimate uh, accounts? There are a couple. Um, uh, Michener's is not one of them. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of a paranoid Nixonian fantasy. It's, it's a lot of conspiracy theories. That was written immediately after uh, the shootings. It's, probably the most famous account. Uh, there have been probably, oh, I don't know, a dozen books. Most of them were written maybe f two or three years after the shootings. And there was nothing for a long time. Once in a while, one will pop up. Um, there have been a couple good ones, but really nothing. I thought there would be more competition, honestly. Coming into the 50th, I thought there's going to be like 10 books. And there was nothing. I was really surprised by that. There was uh, one book by Deborah Wiles, who's a YA author. It was like almost like a spoken word type thing. And that was about it. So I, my book was getting this huge play. You know, I was going to get a write-up in The New Yorker, with all this stuff. And then, again, something happened. Um, I forget what. And all of that went away. But, uh, you know, it was a perfect plan. But it just didn't, it just didn't pan out. Um, your, all your previous books were um, mostly autobiographical. What, what prompted the, the move or the jump to a, a historical story? Well, you know, uh, it's just something different. You know, I like to try new things. I like, I like challenges. So um, my friend Dahmer was autobiographical because it had to be. There's no other way to tell that story. I was a part of it. Um, my other books are more, they're, they're not really autobiographical, they're sort of based on experience, but they're not straight autobio, autobio they're, they're fiction. And then this one is completely outside my wheelhouse, and my next one will be completely something different. So, you know, you just, I don't want to get stuck in one place. Um. Durf, yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm from London, so I'm not familiar with whether there is any kind of memorial uh, on the campus. For there this? is, yes. Yeah. Um, it was actually, there was just a tornado on campus, and the tree fell on the memorial, um, and kind of shattered some of it. Uh, the students of 1970 were overjoyed this happened because they hate the memorial, <laughs> so they're hoping they'll... They'll rebuild one in a better in a better way, but there's a wonderful walking tour, um, and they put in plaques. They have little mark. They have like uh, markers where the four fell in the parking lot, 
which are, of course, covered with stones. It's very moving. And now they put in markers where all the, the wounded were when they were hit. And the, the site itself is now preserved as a National Historical Site. That just happened uh, two years ago, I think two or three years ago. I can't remember which. And uh, they have a wonderful walking tour. They have a museum there, a visitor center. They've really embraced the history, which they didn't for a long time. They tried to bury it for 20 years, 25 years. And then there was a change in thinking, thank God. I think enough time had passed. And now they embrace it as a teaching tool. It's, it's really quite moving to move through this space. It's, 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 I spent a lot of time down there you know, composing scenes because it's important as a visual artist to put yourself in a space if you can and kind of see how you move through that space and what you can pull out of that and put into your story just to get a sense of the distances and um, things like that. So yeah, I, I mean, I highly recommend visiting it if anyone is, if you're near Kent, stop and take a look. It's, it's very, very moving. Oh, sure. Thanks for having me, everyone.